Good evening and welcome. Greetings to all of you gathered in many different places, yet gathered as one body of Jesus Christ under the cross of Christ. The Lord be with you. I want to express my appreciation once again to the production team that's here to help us pull off this service. I'm very grateful for all that you are doing, many different uh, talents and skills that will make this service what it's going to be today. This is, of course, Monday Thursday, a day that takes its name from the Latin word uh, command or mandate. It's the night on which Jesus Christ commanded His disciples to love one another. And so we um, also know that that's the night that He instituted the Lord's Supper which we will be sharing here in just a few moments. This is also a night in the tradition of this congregation that would have been, had we been able to gather together, the night we served First Communion to several of our young people. But obviously with all this going on, we've had to postpone that event. But I promise you, we're going to do it, and, and we will do it in a very special way when we have an opportunity to gather again. So hang in there and keep listening to words from from Matt and from me, and we will make sure that all of that happens. We uh, we want to remind you as well that we will gather here tomorrow night again at 7 o'clock for our Good Friday service, and then again Easter Sunday morning at 1045. Uh, We encourage you to invite your friends and families, just as you would if we were in this building, to worship with you, even though they may be in other places. Come together as the body of Christ on that very uh, special um, Easter morning. Let me remind you too that Saturday evening at 8 o'clock, if you wish to participate, the community is going to gather in the parking lot at the Springfield Regional Medical Center. We pull into the parking lot at 8 o'clock, turn the flashers on on our cars, spend 20 minutes in prayer, and at 8.20 we honk our horns as a collective way of saying amen, and then we leave. We continue as well to partner with Hope, Jackie Mounts and her Hope Ministry, to provide meals for uh, the hungry. Jackie is feeding over 150 people each evening, Monday through Friday, a hot meal, and giving them a sack lunch for the next day as well. Several of you have been bringing in non-perishable items that we've already taken a big load down to Jackie, and she's most appreciative, and we're going to continue to do that. So as you're out shopping or have opportunity and you think about that, please make sure that you remember the less fortunate in our community. Now, once again, we want to turn our minds away from all of the stresses and anxieties that become a part of this this, uh, season, the realities of these days, and we're going to turn our hearts toward the Lord for this time of worship. You and I, though distant in faraway places, You and I have been gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. We come now to a time of call to worship. Um, I, I will be reading one portion. If you've downloaded the worship resources that are available to you on the website, those, um, those will have with you this call to worship in it. Um, I will be doing the part labeled P for pastor. Pastor Brian will be doing the A, which will stand for associate and all. So we're asking you to join with Pastor Brian as uh, on the letters marked A. Come and worship. Come and remember the love of Jesus as He gathers around the table with His disciples for their last supper. We have come to receive from Christ the bread of life and the cup of blessing. Come and receive the humble service offered by Jesus to those He loves, seen in the washing of their feet. We have come to receive the challenge of the new commandment He gave us to love one another as I have loved you. Come and remember the many temptations of a world that would entice us, like Judas and Peter, to betray and deny this one who was willing to suffer for us. We have come to pray that we might not fall into temptation and to yield our wills to His perfect will. Come and listen to the heart of the Savior as He cries out in anguish in the garden. 
We have come to journey with Jesus as he leads us to the cross so that our Easter praise may be filled with new depths of meaning. Come, let us worship together. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment to love one another as he had loved them. By your Holy Spirit, write this commandment on our hearts. Show us how to love in both word and deed in this time of isolation. Shape our hearts, our wills, and our minds to be like yours in all things. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who is alive with you and the, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join us in the singing of our opening hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane. It's number 109 in the Green Lutheran Book of Worship. The words are also printed in that worship resource packet you may have downloaded. Let us sing. we did in the call to worship, please join Pastor McGee in responding during this time of confession and repentance. In Jesus Christ, God has revealed his great love and has extended to all who believe in him the promise of eternal life. In Jesus Christ, we have been commanded to proclaim to others and to convey through our lives, for on this night he said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Please use this time of silence as a time of confession and repentance.
Merciful God, we confess that so often our discipleship has been weak. We have failed to serve as Jesus served. Forgive us, Lord. We have failed to love one another as Jesus has loved us. Forgive us, Lord. We have been happy to proclaim our devotion to Jesus with our lips, only later to deny him by our actions. Forgive us, Lord. Merciful God, empower us by your spirit to be faithful and obedient to you in every time of trial. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus himself said, the thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life. Therefore, the good news is this. In Jesus Christ, you are loved. By faith in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. From wherever you are, share the peace with those who are around you. If you're done sharing the piece, then I invite you to uh, gather the children up here closer to the television set so we have an opportunity to uh, share a little bit in the children's sermon. So come on up close. Come on up close. This is one of those days in the church year that has a funny name, a word that uh, doesn't get used anywhere else during the course of the school of the year, the church year, in any other way. And that name is this name right here, Monday, Monday. And it kind of looks like Monday, doesn't it? But it's Monday. Um, and that word, as I said earlier in the service, that word comes from a Latin word, which means a mandate. And a mandate is sort of like a commandment. It's, it's something that you're told to do. You've been mandated to do it. And we call this day Monday Thursday, because of the many things that happened to Jesus on this day, one of the most important ones is he said to his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. Now, when we hear that, when we hear somebody talk about love, the first thing that comes to our mind is some kind of a feeling. You know, we might say, I really like them, so I love them a whole lot. But Jesus did something even more amazing than that to show us what his kind of love was really like. Right as they were getting ready to eat the supper that night, Jesus got a bowl of water, and he took a towel, and he went around the room, and he washed the feet of everybody who was in that room. Now, we might say, well, that's really weird. Why would somebody want to wash their feet? Well, here's why. Back in those days, when they ate, they ate lying down. Kind of like you would do if you were laying on your living room floor watching TV and maybe eating a bowl of popcorn. You're stretched out there, and your feet go one way, and your head goes another, and you've got your food there in front of you. But because they, because they were around the table, your feet would be close to my head. And if you had stinky feet, that wouldn't be a good thing. So one of the very important traditions back in that day was somebody in the room, usually the person that everybody thought was the least important, had the job of going around and washing everybody's feet. Now Jesus did that, and he wasn't the least important person in the room. He was the most important person in the room. But he showed his disciples that sometimes we can begin to think we're something important. But the way you show people love is you do something for them that really is humbling, that really is, is something that makes them feel 
loved. It's an action you do to make them feel loved. But it's something that maybe, maybe embarrasses you just a little bit. It's something that's, that's not really comfortable for you to do. And Jesus says, it's real easy for us to say, I like somebody. It goes to a whole different level if we say, I like them enough, I'm going to do something for them that really makes me feel uncomfortable. When we can do that for other people, when we can do something for them that they need, even though it makes us uncomfortable, we're doing what Jesus says when he says, love them like I loved you. Not just with words, but with the things that we do so that my love is more than just something that happens with my lips, but it's something that makes a difference in the lives of people around them. And that becomes a very important thing. So when you see this word, and when you hear this, this word come up every year about Monday, Thursday, I want you to think about a bowl of water and a towel. And think, Jesus taught us to do even the least important job to make sure that somebody's needs were being met, even if that makes us uncomfortable. And when we do that, when we do that, then we're loving like Jesus loved. And that's our goal. That's always our goal. All right, thanks for listening. Now, all these Monday, Thursday services, there's not a children's bulletin. That's just a Sunday thing. But I thank you for doing it. So maybe what you could do, maybe what you could do is to think of a way that for the people at your house, what's something that you could do to show them, not just say to them, but to show them you love them today? What could you do? You be creative. And then maybe send me a note to tell me what it was you did, okay? I'd really like to hear that. Thanks for listening. Our first reading comes from the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family. One on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for his household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter beginning in verse 23. And Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel for this Monday, Thursday is Luke chapter 22. I'll be reading verses 14 through 20 and then jumping down to verse 39 and reading through verse 46. So if you're following in your Bibles at home, you'll want to be in Luke chapter 22. And we read, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray that you will not fall into temptation. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we turn our hearts and our minds to you in these moments. We want to begin to identify with your moments there in that garden as you prayed. You prayed those words that we know so well. Not my will, but thine be done. Speak to us this day, Father, about the will, our wills. Help us to understand how to yield those to your perfect will so that we can be faithful in our discipleship that we can be great lights for the world that needs to see Jesus Christ. Grant this, we pray in your name. Amen. The, the 1990 Cincinnati Reds had just wrapped up the National League pennant, beating Barry Bonds and the Pittsburgh Pirates four games to two. Next up was the World Series against the highly favored Oakland A's. Reds manager Lou Piniella was in his office at Riverfront Stadium along with broadcaster Marty Brenneman and Dayton Daily News sports writer Hal McCoy when the advance scouts dropped off their report about the A's. There was a moment of silence as Piniella scanned the report. When he was done, he laid it down and he looked up and smiled and told Brenneman and McCoy, mark it down. The Reds will sweep the World Series. The A's don't have anybody who can hit our pitching. And he was right. Only four games, a sweep, and only one of those four games was even close. Before the World Series ever began, Pinella knew what the outcome was going to be. There's a classic leadership principle that simply says this, the outcome is always determined before the outset. The outcome is always determined before the outset. Or put another way, the battle is over before the battle begins. 
Now you might think this is a bit odd, my wife certainly does, but for pleasure I've been reading the personal memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant. Even though General Grant never phrases it this way, it's a principle that is throughout the 500 pages of that book as he describes the various battles of the Civil War. He knew what the outcome of the battle was going to be before he ever engaged the, the enemy in battle. The outcome was determined before the outset. And before every battle, whether it's in the Civil War or anything else, you and I are faced with a pivotal decision, a moment of pivotal decision. And the outcome of the battle will turn on that decision. For a Civil War general, that might be how you deploy your troops or where you position your supply train. For a pitcher in a ball game, it might be a pitch selection or the location of the pitch. For a manager, it might be a substitution that has to get made. But for the Christian, for a person who wants to follow Jesus with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, that pivotal decision will always revolve around a matter of the will. For us as Christians following Jesus, our pivotal decision is always a matter of our will. Now as you know, during this Lenten season we've been on a journey. We've been following Jesus as He resolutely set out for Jerusalem. We followed Him to multiple destinations, each one an essential component in our own quest to become people who are spiritually mature and fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Today our journey brings us here to a garden located at the foot of the Mount of Olives, just a short distance outside the city walls of Jerusalem. This is a destination that is a place of solitude, a place where Jesus liked to go often to spend time alone with His disciples and time alone with His Heavenly Father. This is not his first trip to this space. But on this day, in that peaceful place, Jesus was faced with his pivotal decision. And the outcome of the coming battle would be determined on this night. Now as Christians today, you and I celebrate that decision. We even create depictions of it, like the beautiful stained glass window that's in the front of our sanctuary. And we know the words by heart. We know what Jesus said. Say them with me. Not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. Now let's just pause for a moment, wherever we are, and just say, thank you, Jesus, for making the decision that you did. Thank you for choosing God's will over your will in that moment. You know, sometimes we think that the hardest part of this Holy Week for Jesus must have been the day He was crucified. Certainly that was painful. But let me suggest to you this, the hardest part of Holy Week was the time that Jesus spent in prayer in the garden. Once He prayed, not my will, but thine be done, the battle was over. The victory was won. Long before the battle ever began, the outcome was known. Victory over sin, death, and the devil could have been declared at that very moment. The key in the yielding of the will is always the yielding of the will. The prayer that every one of us needs to be able to pray is not my will, but yours be done, Jesus. And we quickly agree with that. Nobody's going to argue that point with me. But the truth is that getting to the place where I can really genuinely pray that from the depths of my heart might well require that I sweat a little blood in the, in the process. It's not an easy place to arrive. So with that in mind, let me share with you some insights gained here in the garden. Here's the first one. We must always recognize that temptation is present. We must recognize that temptation is always present with us. Jesus knew that in instinctively. That's why He told the disciples 
when they got to the place of the garden, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. The disciples were still learning. Jesus knew it. And you know what I find fascinating in that? The temptation for those disciples came in the form of a nap. They fell victim to a nap. Because they were sleeping, they weren't praying. And because they weren't praying, when the battle began to wage, all of those coming events of Holy Week, Peter's going to deny Jesus three times. Every one of the disciples is going to hightail it out of there. We're eventually going to find them hiding in a safe house, hidden from away from the religious leaders. I don't know about you, but my prayer times are always surrounded by times of, of temptation. I find that when I sit down to pray, my mind starts to race. As hard as I try to turn off everything that's there, my mind speeds up instead of slowing down. I think of things that I need to do, people I need to talk to, problems I need to resolve. Some days I'll confess that I'm even tempted to say, Lord, I got a lot to do today. I'll make it up tomorrow. The devil knows that it's in our times of prayer, those times of intimate conversation that we have with our Heavenly Father, that the matter of the will gets addressed. That is, it gets addressed if I pray properly. My prayer cannot be, and yours cannot be, one of those rapid grocery list style of prayers. Lord, give me this, give me that, give me what I need. But it has to be a prayer that's focused in on hearing and sensing what God is doing in our lives. We need to be able to wrestle with God about the things for which we are praying. Which leads me to insight number two. Secondly, we need to rely upon our relationship with God. Pay attention to two phrases there in Luke chapter 22. The first one is in verse 41. It says, Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. And the second one is two verses later, verse 43. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. What I see in those verses is a two-way engagement in prayer. Jesus talks to the Father, the Father responds. Jesus pours out his heart, and God sends a ministering angel to provide strength in the struggle. That's the description of a relationship that has been developed over time. The Gospels record 26 different instances of Jesus spending time with his heavenly Father. In my personal devotions this past week, I was reading about one of them. Right after the feeding of the 5,000, that wonderful miracle, Jesus dismisses the crowd and he goes up on top of a mountain to pray. When he comes down from that time of prayer, that's the story of him walking on the water to meet the boat that's halfway across the lake. But because Jesus spent so much time in prayer, he and his heavenly Father had the kind of relationship where Jesus felt full freedom to be totally honest and pour out his heart to his Father. And he did. He begs God in verse 42, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. He knew he could be honest with God. He knew he could share his deepest feelings. And he knew that his Father would love him and care for him even if he asked for another way. That's a key lesson for every one of us to learn. It's a growth point in our spiritual development. In, in the first congregation I pastored, one of my members took a big risk and confessed to me that he was very angry with God. So as I listened, I talked to him about the fact that King David also got very angry with God. And we opened up the scriptures and I took him to some of the Psalms where David vents about his anger to God. And my, my friend told me, oh, I could never tell God that. My response, he already knows. He's just waiting to talk to you about it. He told me later that that realization took his prayer life to a whole new level. 
he was able to pour out his heart before his heavenly father and say, I'm angry about this, Lord. I think you've mistreated me. And he and God were able to address issues in his life. If you allow yourself to be honest with your father and you allow yourself to wrestle things through with God, you'll find yourself at insight number three, where we realize we must realize that God has a greater purpose. Even in the midst of our most powerful struggles, God is always doing something greater than you and I can see with our human eyes. In my sermon on Palm Sunday earlier this week, I reminded us that we needed to see what God sees. And here that truth surfaces again. Jesus could yield his will to the Father because he knew the Father's will was something far bigger than what Jesus had in mind. There was a bigger plan. And so he didn't just pray, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. He prayed, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus came to the realization that the Heavenly Father had a will that needed to be accomplished too. And in that moment, Jesus switched his focus from his own will to the will of the Father. God always has a purpose. And even if I can't see it, that purpose is always bigger than my role in it. That's what the prophet Isaiah reminded us of when he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Sometimes, sometimes God's greater purpose is best fulfilled through my discomfort. Hear me in that. Sometimes God's greater purpose is best fulfilled in my discomfort. When Jesus took that little boy's lunch, you know, that lunch of five loaves and two fish, he had to break it before it could feed the multitudes. God's best work often comes through the brokenness in the lives of people. Being broken is never my will. But when I yield to it, it's in that breaking that the blessing comes. Insight number four. When the prayer's done, we must rise up. Verse 45 says, when Jesus rose from prayer and went back to his disciples, he found them asleep. Here's what I, here's what I see. Jesus had prayed until his will was fully yielded to the Father's will. And then he got up. The decision was made. It was now time for the battle to begin. And it does just two verses later in verse 47, it says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up and a man who was called Judas, one of the 12 was leading them. For those in the crowd, it looked like the beginning of the war. And technically I suppose that it was. But remember, the outcome is determined before the outset. In our journey with Jesus, he will bring us to a place where our wills will be confronted with his will. It's part of your spiritual growth process. And he will keep bringing you to that moment until you learn how to do it. It's one of the last major steps in your maturity process. In just a couple of minutes, you and I will be led in the Lord's Prayer, something we pray every week and something that some of you pray every day. Pastor McGee will be the one leading it. And because his voice will be the one with the microphone, the words you will hear being said uh, will come from his lips. And he will say this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When you pray that, will you mean it? When you pray, Father, your will be done, do you mean it? Can you stand before your heavenly Father and say with complete honesty, Lord, everything in my life today, every success, every dream, 
every painful situation, I yield it to you. Thy will be done. Can you? If not, if the answer to that question is no, I can't do that, then you need to stay in the garden. Get back down on your knees and spend some more time before your heavenly Father. Sweat a little bit more blood and wrestle it through until you can come to the place where your answer is yes. Father, not my will, but yours be done. And when it's a yes, then rise up and let the battle begin. Amen. Our worship continues now with the confession of our faith and the words of the Apostles' Creed. And therefore, together we confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Father, on this holy evening, we give you thanks and we praise the holy name of Jesus Christ who gives us a mandate, who gives us a commandment to love others as we have been loved in Jesus Christ. We come into your presence with joy as we are reminded of the Holy Spirit that draws us to this place on our journey. And so we pray first for ourselves. As you have come not to be served, but to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many, so grant us the same heart tonight and the same desire to yield our wills to you that like Christ we might say, Lord, not our will be done, but yours be done. Holy Father, this evening we pray for our one that one person in our lives who does not know you, we pray that you would draw them to yourself and claim their life as your own, that turning to you and from their sin to the presence of Christ who draws them even now, that they might come into a life-saving and transformational relationship with Jesus. Lord, we are filled with joy for how your hand of mercy is upon our world in this season of our lives. And so we pray for our world. We pray for its people and all of our leaders. We lift to you tonight in prayer our president, our governor, senators, and congressional representatives, all of our local elected officials and our judges. Lord of mercy, we pray for an extension of your hand of mercy upon them that the heavenly wisdom of God might be given them to faithfully lead us in this time of pandemic. And we pray for this, your church, for on this holy night you gave to us the body and the presence of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us and for all people. Tonight, as we partake of this holy sacrament, may you remind us of the call of the mandate and the command to love as you have loved us. We pray for those tonight of our own people in this community struggling so great in their time of need and around the world with the coronavirus that continues wreaking havoc upon our lives. We pray for all people in retirement homes, assisted living facilities, the homebound, all with ongoing illness, and Lord, all who need a special touch from you. 
Fill them, Lord, tonight with your peace, the peace that surpasses all human understanding, as even now in these quiet moments, we name those who lay heavy burden upon our hearts before you. Lay your hand of healing upon them in body and bring strength and comfort to them in spirit. For into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And together we say, Amen. Our worship service continues this Monday, Thursday with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Those can be given online at www.grace slash NALC.org, www.grace slash NALC.org, or you can also give online there on the app. I want to encourage you to be faithful in this time in your life. Maybe you're without a job or without finances. God has been faithful to us. He will always provide for us. So let us give back to the Lord what is already His. Now is also a great time to prepare your communion elements. Here in a few moments, we will be serving Holy Communion, and you will be serving those in your home. So now is a great time to go ahead and grab some bread and some grape juice, as here in a few moments, we will share in this Holy Supper together. Now let us give back to the Lord what is already His.
We have come now to the celebration of Holy Communion. As Lutheran Christians, we believe, teach, and practice what Jesus Christ tells us it is. It is his body and his blood, given to us in, with, and under the bread and the wine, given to us freely for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life in his name. And therefore, all who believe in Jesus, all who have been baptized into Jesus, are welcome to receive Jesus in this his holy supper. This evening on Monday, Thursday, you will be serving yourselves there in your homes, wherever you have gathered. One of you will take the bread and say, this is the body of Christ given for you. Another there in your home will take the grape juice and say, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Those are the brief instructions and therefore let us begin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, he blessed it. He gave it for all to drink saying, this is the new covenant of my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Holy Father, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may now serve the body and the blood of Jesus Christ in your homes. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
As we near the end of our worship service, we come now to the stripping of the altar. And as Pastor Broadbrecht stips the pyramids and the linens on the altar, we are reminded that Jesus Christ was stripped of everything for us. Hear now the words of Psalm chapter 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O Lord, you are not far off. O oh, my strength, come quickly and help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who could not keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people 
yet unborn, for he has done it. We sing now our sending hymn, O sacred head now wounded, let us sing together. receive the blessing and the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.